This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. officers face every day are not always obvious. As Idaho State Trooper Stephen Hobbs discovered on the night of June 15, 1991, while patrolling a remote stretch of highway near the Utah border. They think he saw a car spinning behind him. He got over so this car wouldn't see him. Down there south, the Swedes are going over the summit. There's about a mile in there where the road's right between the two mountains. And that radio area down there is not the best. So he didn't check out on the stop. Okay, this is D Idaho State Police Dispatcher D. Silver was nearing the end of her shift. Now, I just want to, hold on just a minute. I heard somebody screaming over the radio. Did you hear what he said? I knew whatever it was I heard wasn't right. Corporal Delon Jones was also on patrol that night. Did you copy that? No, I didn't. He said, I'm officer in trouble. I need help. My stomach went through the floor. But I didn't know for sure where he was at. 522, he's south. The suites are screaming for help. I know where his location is. I just turned cold. I was the closest police officer to Steve, and I was almost 70 miles away. Control for all units on frequencies, clear the air for emergency traffic only. I kept thinking that maybe he had a drunk or something that was fighting him. The longer it went, the, the scarier I got. I started calling the bosses and got them both going that way. And then I called an ambulance. The hardest part was not knowing what kind of trouble was he in. Floyd Vable and his family were on their way home in two cars from a family reunion. I can't well, I can see, see some dust. There's smoke coming up there. I looked up and there was smoke bellowing up. up about a mile and a half up ahead. When we got up there, we could see that there was a patrol car on fire. Look at that. Get around there, Brian. Turn around. My wife stopped in front of us. Keep it going. We really couldn't see inside, but there was nobody standing around. I could hear my son saying, Dad, it's going to blow up. And then I thought, well, if there's somebody in there, I better get at it. I 
grabbed him, and he was just soaked with blood all the way down here. And I asked him what happened, and he said, shot, shot. I found a hole through his arm, and also found a hole through his chest. Floyd's daughter, Sherry, tried to comfort the wounded officer. His eyes were blankly staring, and I thought, he really needs some help. But we were a long ways from any medical facilities of any kind. I was saying, get somebody in a car, go find them there's phone. You feel so absolutely responsible. You almost want to say, you son of a gun, you better not die on me. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. The wounded officer's wife, Jan Hobbs, a Minidoka sheriff's dispatcher, was monitoring local radio traffic. I heard a couple of ambulances being sent out. I thought something's wrong somewhere, and that's when I went to search and rescue. I didn't want to believe it. My officers had out there now. Do we have a condition on him? We don't. All I could think of is that I needed him to stay alive for me and the kids. When we continue. There's no sign of any help coming, and I just thought, I'm going to sit here and watch this person die. When Idaho State Trooper Stephen Hobbs was shot during a routine traffic stop in a remote area, his life was in the hands of the passing motorists who stopped to help. But there was little hope that they'd be able to keep him alive long enough to get him the medical care he desperately needed. Everybody was doing whatever they could. Sherry was trying to cradle his head a little bit, make it more comfortable. His lips started to go blue, and it wasn't too long after that that his breathing stopped entirely. I just thought to myself, you know, okay, here we go. I'm going to try to remember how to do this. Come on, come on, come on, you can make it, boy. Come on. She would give him a, a breath of air. Then I could see him breathing. And then it would quit. So then she would do it again. I was really getting worried because there was no sign of any help coming, and I just thought, I'm going to sit here and watch this person die. Off-duty EMT John Cook and his brother happened to be driving by on their way home from vacation. You could see the flames shooting up pretty high. I really didn't know what I was coming up on. I had my trauma kit in the back. I figured I'd better find out what's going on. I looked up, and here come a guy running across the street with a black bag. And that was really a relief. I thought, man, we got some help. Somebody that knows something, you know. He's been shot. Where's he been shot at? He got a bullet hole right here. He was hurting very badly. And he was in a very deep state of shock. Because his brain wasn't receiving enough oxygen, he was getting very combative. It's all right. It's all right. Where are we going? Come on, Bill. Get some stuff open. Then I had my brother Bill putting some gauze on each hole that he could see and putting pressure on it. Did anybody ask for help? I didn't know if help was coming. I did grab his police radio and tried to use it several times. Response. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? And didn't find one channel that worked. I knew what I was lacking, and that was advanced life support. So my only other option was to move him to the nearest town. I don't think we're going to have any help. Here comes an RV. Flag him down. Gerald Jepson and his wife were driving by pulling a trailer. I'm not the type that usually stops to get involved with anything, but when they came running towards the truck, after seeing the look on their face, I knew that we had to do it. Six of us picked up the trooper and took him in. 
they was moving him pretty fast. He was just white and lifeless. It scared me pretty bad, but he was pretty close to dead right then. Then somebody says, drive as fast as this thing will go to Snowville. All of a sudden, he started saying, I just want to die. I just want to die. And at that point, I started getting very scared and very nervous because when people give up, it's only a matter of time. Everybody was saying, don't give up now. Think of your children and your, your wife. It was like a cheering section. Just really in there with their whole body and soul. State trooper picked up Jan Hobbs to take her to her husband. I was scared to death. I just, I wanted to be able to tell him that I loved him before he might never hear me say that again. There were no medical facilities in Snowville. Rescuers worked for 45 minutes trying to keep trooper Steve Hobbs going long enough for an air ambulance to get to the scene. We stood there by the, the door hoping to hear some good news and finally they said well we got his blood pressure back we got a pulse back that was the biggest relief of my life and he was still alive Steve was airlifted to the trauma unit of McKay D hospital by the time he arrived, more than two hours had passed since the shooting. His wife arrived soon after. When I saw him, he was white, like a dolphin white color. I told him that I loved him, and I just wanted him to hang in there for me and the kids. We're going to need to go. The emergency physician Ivan Wright examined Steve's x-rays to determine the extent of the damage done by the bullets. This is the initial x-ray that we took. He had had uh, injury to both lungs and he had a significant injury to the artery in his arm. This is dye in, in the artery going into his arm and you see it comes down to here and stops. That's where he's bleeding from. The axillary artery was almost totally severed. To be honest, I'm, I'm quite amazed that he survived. A year has passed. For Steve Hobbs and his family, the healing continues. Doctors were able to partially repair severed nerves in his right arm, but he has only limited use of that hand. Due to lack of oxygen, Steve also suffered some short-term memory impairment, as well as permanent loss of 50% of his vision. There are times when I just feel like I'm going to explode inside because I can't do the things that I used to be able to do. And it's very hard. And my daughter always tells me, chill out. And so there's a lot of times where I just have to go off by myself and sit down and try and collect myself again. So there's been quite a few changes I've had to try and make with my life. Since he's been shot, it's been kind of a role reversal. He's used to being the provider, and now he's home with the kids. But we've all learned how to deal with it. Steve means everything to me. He is my other half. I just will never be able to repay the people who took the time to rescue Steve. I never knew there were so many people that cared. <laughs> the first time I met Steve, after all this happened, and there was no feeling ever like it before. Knowing that I did something for this guy that would keep him around. The man Steve pulled over that night had been driving a stolen car. He pleaded guilty to three felonies and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. The incident has affected all the people who got involved that night. This changed me quite a bit. I haven't had a low opinion of policemen, but I stay away from them. But this has really made me realize what they go through. We see a cop car and we automatically let off the gas and hope we get by them. And we don't realize the dangers they're living under to try to protect us. I guess the best 
reward we ever had was the party for him at the Twin Falls when they put us with four of their little boys. Uh, these little kids, they were just, they were happy and smiling. And of course I couldn't, couldn't help remembering when I was their age, uh, I was on the scene when my dad had an accident and he died. So I was raised without one and they had theirs. Don't fall down. And to me, that's all it counted.